God of grace and God of glory. We come to you now knowing that you can heal people's bodies, you can heal their minds, you can heal their hearts. We pray for physical healing upon those that need it. May your healing hand of comfort be upon them as they go through the ordeals they have to go through in life, as they struggle with the frailties of being here on earth. Might you comfort them and guide them there. For those that are in need because of items of grief, items of anxiety that hit our hearts, help our minds function in the way that, that you purposed us to function. Help us to be those that appreciate the creation you've given us in every day of life that we have. And Lord, for our church, for the general church and the, and the turmoil that it suffers right now, might you be with us. And for this church, may we be a beacon of hope in the midst of this little community. And might we be also a beacon of hope for each other and help and guidance. And Lord God, we ask for your blessings upon the remainder of our service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We have another hymn, and that's hymn number 618. Would you please stand? Number 618. Let us break bread together. Number 618. Please stand. Scripture reading is one that's not in the bulletin, but it's a part of the lection this week. It's from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, and it, it is somewhat applicable to what I'm going to be preaching about. From Mount Hor, they set out by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But there is no food or water here. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and so many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents. So Moses prayed to the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look 
at it and live. So Moses made the serpent of bronze, put it upon the pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, the person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. And in the Gospel of John, we have these words, which are very famous words to us, although we don't always use them properly. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Verily, very truly, I say to you, no one can do to the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can one be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished when I tell you you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear it and the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, do you not believe? How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, and he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his, world into the, his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There was a church in, outside of the campus in Princeton University, the Princeton Seminary, and there's a a, a, a preaching teacher by the name Tom Long. He's fairly well known. He's still active at Campbell Seminary. He's about 10 years older than me. And he's written a lot of books. When he was at Princeton, he decided to go to a particular Presbyterian church that everybody talked about. He thought that's the place to go. They always have the great preachers there. And one of the things about mainline Presbyterians is a lot of them have really, really good preachers. So he went to that church. Well, that church has started off as a very common working class church in that neighborhood, but as Princeton grew and grew and things took over, it became one of these sort of elite and educated churches. Well, where most everybody in the church had some a few letters behind their names and, and the pastors who got up, they essentially didn't preach to the people that anybody could understand. They preached to the congregation that had already, some of them had taken Greek and Hebrew and some of them are acquainted with the scriptures in ways that most people couldn't be. Well, there was one man he met at a fellowship dinner one year and one night, and he said to him, he said, you look like an old-timer in this church. He said, yes, I am. I've been here from just about the beginning for a long, long time. I'm the last one left here that was here in the beginning. He said, well, why are you here? He said, well, I, he said, I'm here. I like the way the preacher sounds, but I don't always know what he's talking about but I stay and I listen. And when you guys sit around the table and talk about your classes at Princeton, I have no idea what you're saying. He said, well, why do you say? He said, you gotta understand something. Many years ago, we decided every Friday night, we'd go to that boy's home down the road and we'd play basketball with him. I mean, we'd do things with him. He said, I'm too old to play basketball, but I still go. And he said, you know one thing about doing what God tells you to do? He said, just like I don't understand what that preacher says, he said, I don't think he always knows that everything he says is going to be exactly right. But if you do the works of God, like we do on Friday night, you understand that every word that God has said is absolutely true. As we do the work of God, as we do those things that God has called us to do, as we reach out into the community, as we love one another, then we know God's word is true. Everyone. Nicodemus, poor old Nicodemus. Nicodemus is talked about so much. Nicodemus was a leader among the Pharisees. In other words, he was a head honcho among head honchos. He had a really high position. 
But in the midst of his high position, in the midst of him checking off all of the boxes he could check off of the things he was doing right, I'm sure Nicodemus was a really good and impressive man. But there was something he could not understand. There was something he couldn't put in that box. There's something he couldn't capture. And he desperately wanted to know the origin of salvation. How do I get from the then to the now and from the here to the there? How do I cross over? How do I know that God is real? How did I know that God is going to do everything that I teach about and that I read about all the time? So in order to do this, the scene is set that Nicodemus went to Jesus, desperately seeking the origin of salvation. He went at night, but he wanted more than anything else to know. And we, like Nicodemus, are naturally drawn to want to know all about God, all about our salvation, all about what comes next, all about where we're going and where we have been. We want to know. But let me tell you a few facts that have to be hit, some realities that just fall upon us when we seek that origin of our salvation. And let us uh, weigh in on some of the facts of that search. The first one is, first fact, it is a frightening quest. Those first two verses say it all. There was a man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Now what does that scripture tell us about Nicodemus and what does it tell us about Jesus? First of all, Nicodemus, who was a head teacher, went to Jesus and called him rabbi. He acknowledged the status of Jesus. He recognized Jesus as being someone that made a difference in the life of Judaism, in the life of the Israelites. He saw him and said, here's Jesus the rabbi. He cannot possibly be doing things except he's linked up with God. He's got to be linked. I want to see what it is. But he came at night. And we take a lot about him come, make a lot about him coming at night, and there's a lot to it. But I think that Nicodemus was frightened to come to him during the day. Because Jesus had questioned some of the things that the Pharisees were doing, and Nicodemus heard those questions, and he thought there was something to those questions. But at the same time, he couldn't give up what he was over there to find out what Jesus was doing. For once he was exposed that he was going to this radical rabbi in the middle of the night, then his credibility, perhaps even his life, would be in danger. Now let's track that forward 2,000 years for us. We face sometimes the real fear that we have in our lives when we look at God and salvation. All of us have a fear of death. There's no question there. But it's difficult, you see, for us to be a believer in the skeptical world. For things in our world seem to get worse every day, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. I always tell people when they think things are bad today, I go back to the year 1500, and you'll see when things could have been worse. But anyway, things are in one of those downturns in, in Christianity, on a downturn of religion. They really are. It's difficult to be a believer in this skeptical world. It is difficult and challenging, no matter where we're going, to move in a different direction than the rest of the world is moving. Right now, it's difficult to move in any kind of different direction. You either got to be all here, all there, all there, and if you're a little different, then you don't fit anywhere. It means as simple as that. We are being programmed into things today. There's one of these things that was a big deal, maybe a big deal at least if you worked in cities and, and dealt with what I call coffee house theology and pub theology a few years ago, which I did. I had one of the first pub theology groups in, in uh, the state of Louisiana. But anyway, you deal with all these people that are spiritual but not religious. They know there's something out there that they can't explain, but they're reluctant to call themselves religious because if they do call themselves religious, they get put in a the box they don't want to be put in. And you say it's an excuse, and I know for some of it is, but some of it is a sincere, some of it's a sincere way of, of, uh, of searching. Because it is dangerous. It is difficult to stand for Jesus Christ, to stand for God in these worlds today, in this world today. But it's not the first time. And if you remember the actor Peter O'Toole, he has all kind of, he had all kinds of awards. You know, he's an Irish, British, Irish actor, and uh, he had an Academy Award. He was Sir Peter O'Toole before he passed away. I have a quote from him from the Johnny Carson show several years ago. 
Remember, Johnny Carson used to ask questions that would surprise people. And he asked him about his religion, and this was his answer on the Carson Show. No one can take Jesus away from me. There's no doubt there was a historical figure of tremendous importance with enormous notions such as peace. But then he called himself a retired Christian who prefers an education and reading about the facts than faith. There are so many of us that whether we say it or not, we, like Peter O'Toole, have become retired Christians. We are searching for the facts, and we leave that mystical thing about Jesus out of our lives, and we have lost it in such a way. It is a frightening quest to stay close to God in our world today. The second fact I would give you is when you're looking for that salvation origin, it has a cryptic answer. Verses 3 and 4 kind of tell us a little bit about that, and I got there's a lot to say about these. Verse 3 said, Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Now think about it. What is the word we use from born anew or born from above? What do we say? People need to be what? Born again. Born again. There's nothing in that scripture that in the original language that says being born again. It says being born from above. We have taken Nicodemus' misinterpretation of what Jesus said, and some people think Nicodemus was sarcastic. I think he was just lost with it there. He said, how in the world can I jump back in my mother's womb? Being born from above was just beyond him. And being born from above or being born anew is just kind of above us as well. But what it amounts to is we have been born into this world and we have been taught like Nicodemus boxes to check along the way and we're told we must be born from above, born anew, born again, whatever terminology you want to use. It's like, wait a minute, I can't do that. I, I, it's a cryptic answer. It's a cryptic suggestion to tell us that we can be born again because here we are and I'm here and I look at the aging on my hand and my face and I can't possibly... So we're being born in a different realm, in a different world that we live in now. And that's what we have to understand. We all face the difficulty of that. Knowing God's answer to us is that we step outside of our life, ourselves. Because all of God's answers, you see, are supernatural. They're outside of our, they're outside of who we are. We want it to be so simple. Like I know that but Tyler's going to change the light bulbs in here today. And he knows that when he puts those light bulbs in here, that, by the way, are about twice as powerful as these. So my aging eyes might be able to see better up here. I won't have to memorize as much. But anyway, it, it, it's, a, it's a matter that we know how to take care of those kind of things. And that's what we want God to be, something we can throw in the light bulb, something we can take care of like that. We can jump back into our mother's womb, whatever. But his answer is a supernatural. And people look all over the place for it. A very famous pastor was looking for that supernatural one day. This was years back. And he watched a, a, a faith healer named Sandra Coleman. She was very famous in the 60s. And he watched it one time. He went to the, to, to the, uh, uh, the crusade, which was held in, in uh, New York. And he went to the crusade. And, and she brought the people with her that she had healed. That's how she traveled around. And one of them was a rather very well-known doctor. Uh, from uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they claimed a healing from pancreatic cancer. And he came and he gave his healing. And finally, this pastor could not resist it. He wanted to talk to someone who had experienced the supernatural healing of Jesus. So it took him a month or so to find the man's telephone number. Back in those days, he had to go with paper directories and stuff. And he finally found his number. And he called up and a lady answered the phone. And he said, I'm so-and-so, I'd like to speak to doctor, whatever. And dead silence hit the phone. And finally she said, the, the doctor is dead. He died last week. He died of pancreatic cancer. And he said, I couldn't say a word. I just hung up the phone. And he said, I started crying. And my wife said, what, your, what are you crying about? He said, I can't find him. Can't find who? You've had his number. No, I cannot find God. That's our problem sometimes. We want to find God in that checkbox of something. Everyone dies. 
This doctor maybe had a longer life because of prayer. I'm sure he did. But he died. And we all come to that point. And we're looking for boxes to check of jumping back into the womb or something like that so we can be there again. And that's the problem with prayer as well. Prayer is mystical. It's cryptic. Monica and I had many discussions on our back porch. The discussion some years ago was about prayer. We talk about prayer often enough. But this discussion was when something wasn't going our way. And she looked at me, do you think we're just talking in the air? I said, no, but yes at the same time. We need to talk to God. We need to know that sometimes God is going to react in a way we want him to react, and other times he's not. But we pray, and I believe very strongly in the power and the necessity of prayer. But prayer, we don't know where it comes from or where it's going. I'll tell you a grandpa story now. My grandfather was a very simple man. Uh, he worked for the Lane's Cotton Mill in New Orleans. When the Lane's Cotton Mill shut down when he was about 57 years old, you could not find another job when you were 57 in the 50s. They, just, they didn't hire 57-year-old men. Now you got 77-year-old men and won't give up a job for a younger guy. But anyway, back then, 57, you are done. You are done. So he got a truck and a lawnmower and he started cutting grass and doing odd jobs and worked as a watchman at Brown Pickle Factory as well. But he used to come see me often. We, none of us had air conditioners then. And we'd sit outside on the porch and talk. And ever so often, there would be a thunderstorm coming up or something would be coming off the river, seemingly coming off the river from the west, and a cool breeze would start to blow. And I remember what he used to always tell me, because I used to talk incessantly, and Monica would say, I still do when I get on a roll. I have quiet times now, but when, I, when you get me going, I'm going. And she could tell you, well, you got my grandpa going. Wasn't he going too? Okay. And I was going one time, I remember sitting on the front porch on Old Bar Road, and the breeze came up, and he called me Jake. He said, Jake, let's just be quiet for a minute and feel the breeze. Let's be quiet and feel the breeze. I'm going to bring you the prayer now into God's action. Let's be quiet sometimes and feel the presence of God. Let's be quiet and feel God's refreshment come to us. We don't know where it comes from like the breeze and we don't know where it's going, but we can experience it. We can be quiet enough to interact with it. So God finding him is always cryptic. And then the third fact, it has a spectacular solution in those verses. The Exodus story I read, it said that they had doubted God, and when they doubted God enough, snakes were, he said God sent snakes. Well, the snakes were there. They bit the people and they died. And what did God say to do? He said to Moses, build a serpent, put it on the pole, and when they look at the serpent after they've been bitten, they'll be all right. Just looking at it, just being there, made all the difference in the world. And I think we have to understand in that story, it's referred to in the scripture in, the, in John, and I think it's put this way. It said, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the Son of Man be lifted up. And then we get John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his Son. And then 17 is a spectacular twist. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The world was busy condemning itself. We live in a world full of rules. And we say if we follow the rules, we're going to make it. If we don't, we're not. And nobody can follow the rules. Nobody can do it all. Nobody can get where they think to be. But God wants us to live out those words of grace. We are saved by grace. We can miss the point of the sacrifice of Jesus when we live in the world that always finds the problem. There's a, I don't know anything about the drugs hardly at all, but there's a state legislature that uh, entering a bill in our state legislature to outlaw some kind of herbal thing called cartoon or something like that to make it another drug that's illegal. All we do is find out what to make illegal. And I'm not saying they shouldn't do that. But we make all kinds of things illegal, and others make everything legal, but it doesn't make any difference. We try to solve all our problems by finding more problems. And we expect God to do the same. He doesn't work that way. 
He brings grace to the world. We find it difficult to embrace grace because grace leads, grace empowers, grace is with us. Grace leads and empowers us to do the impossible. I love C.S. Lewis. I read a lot of his stuff. There's a story about he said was going to be a speaker at a comparative religions conference. And he walked into the room where the rest of the speakers for that day and the teacher were sitting together. And they were in one whale of an argument, or as he put it in his book, they were in a row. They were in a row about different things. They were talking about where, who is God, and what makes God God, and what makes Jesus God. One of them came up with the concept of the incarnation. That's what makes Christianity different. The incarnation, God becoming man. And one said, hold on a minute. In other religions, they have the incarnation of their God becoming a man. So there's nothing unique about that. And the other one said, oh, it's the resurrection. That's what makes Christianity different. And another one said, hey, wait a minute. There are other world religions that proclaim the resurrection of their leader. And then when Lewis walked in in his tweed jacket with his crumpled papers in his hand, they finally looked at him and they said, we've been waiting for you. What makes Christianity unique? And he said, it's grace. And he didn't say another word. He sat down. The room fell silent. Lewis continued to talk about what is unique about Christianity and its grace. He said, Buddhism has the enlightenment, and indeed there are eightfold enlightenments. You know, Hindus have karma, and if you do right, you get right. If you don't do right, you get wrong. The Jewish code of the, has requirements. The Islamic code says it's love, but there's requirement after requirement. But what did God require of those in the desert that had been bitten by the stake snake and were condemned to die to just look upon the serpent. What does God require of us who have been bitten by the serpent of sin to just look upon and believe in the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One, and salvation comes? And behavior changes, and things become different. The origin of our salvation is grace. That's where it comes from. Just as they looked upon the snake that was many years ago, so are we to look upon that God that has been lifted up. Jesus said, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it is not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is this possible for an adult to be born? Is it impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time? God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. God didn't send them the son of the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Look upon him. Look upon the cross. The origin of our salvation is to look above to the grace that is there. Let us pray. Lord God, we're always grateful that you give us this time to be together. And Lord, as the people of God, called of God, let us do that which you have instructed us to do. Let us look upon you and let you touch our lives in Jesus' name.